Hello and welcome to the third video in the Heads Up for Healthier Brain series. My name is Erica and I'm an education coordinator here at the Alzheimer's Society of Simcoe County. So hopefully you have watched videos one and two and know that today we're going to be talking about all about food. So the title of this video is Healthy Diet, Feed Your Body and Fuel Your Brain. Okay, so if you remember back to video one and we talked about the risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, things that we do have some control over, that two of the main risk factors are type two diabetes, and there is growing evidence to show that type one diabetes can also be a risk factor, although that's more because of people not, not managing their diabetes well. Uh, with type two diabetes, a lot of this is because the risk factors that um, can contribute to the development of type 2 diabetes also can be risk factors for dementia and impact the health of our brain. So uh, type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So again, the main message from the first video, what's good for your heart is good for your brain. So if your heart health is suffering, your cardiovascular system is, is not performing well, it puts your brain at risk because it's not getting the essential oxygen and nutrients up to all of those neurons in the brain and then allowing the brain to discard um, all the the byproduct of all of its chemical interactions you've been doing all day uh, through the cardiovascular system so these two things are are uh, quite important for the health of your brain um, so when we think about dietary risk factors I'm sure that many of you are thinking about the kinds of foods that can put you at risk for type 2 diabetes and the kinds of foods that put you at risk for cardiovascular disease. So these are also the kinds of foods that can put you at risk for dementia. And what kinds of foods are those? So when you think about excess sugar, um, so we know that this is a risk factor for type 2 diabetes. If you have too much sugar in your diet, you can develop type 2 diabetes. So excess sugar can put your brain at risk as well. You think about uh, your heart health and that certain types of fats, mostly the saturated fats, can impact your heart health. Too much salt in your diet can impact your heart health. So these are also important things to consider when you're thinking of your brain health. When you think about processed foods, and processed foods, that's where we see a lot of the excess sugar, saturated fat, and salt. So if we are creating food at home, making foods at home, we have a lot more control over the type of food, type, the amount of sugar, the type of fat, the amount of salt, and so on that goes into the food. Um, so one of the, the messages with the new Canada Food Guide, which we'll talk about in this video, is to try to eat out less and uh, make meals at home more often. We also see that excess alcohol. So if you're drinking moderately within recommended guidelines, that doesn't put you at risk for dementia. But if you drink too much, then that starts to become a risk factor. In fact, there is a type of dementia that is directly tied to excess alcohol use. I'm going to start off with the sugars. So we're talking about carbohydrates here. And there are three categories of carbohydrates, sugars, starches, and fibers. When you think about the cells in our body, our cells need fuel, and it gets this fuel from carbohydrates. It takes the carbs in the food, and it converts it into glucose, and the glucose fuels our cells. Our neurons, because they do so much work for us, they require a lot of fuel in order to perform properly. And so we do need to have carbohydrates in our diet so that it can convert it into the fuel that our brain needs to do its work. The thing is that not all carbohydrates are created equally. When you think about sugars, then you know consider a kid um, on Halloween and they're eating a lot of candy. So this is simple sugar. The body doesn't have to do much work in order to convert it into glucose. It becomes a direct hit to the brain. It, enters the brain quickly, the brain burns it off fast, and then you crash. And so you see kids getting very hyper, running around like crazy, so excited, and then they crash. And so this is the kind of food that we, we want to limit because we want the body to take more time and, and have more effort in order to convert the carbohydrates into the glucose that it needs. So we're wanting to have a diet that's more um, focused on the starches and the fibers. When we do this course in person, 
we pull in a lot of resources from other organizations, reputable sources. And one of the resources we use in this week is from the Diabetes Association, and it is a glycemic index. So it does talk about these different types of carbohydrates, but also the, the index to show how much this food raises your blood sugar. So that's your glycemic index. When you think of that low glycemic index foods, 55 or less, these are the kinds of foods where it raises your blood sugar slowly. Your body takes more time to convert the carbohydrates from these food into glucose. So these kinds of foods, barley, sweet potatoes, oats, apples, those types of things are good foods because it does give your body the fuel, but it releases it more slowly. So it lasts a longer period of time. Medium glycemic index foods. So these ones you're going to choose less often, thinking about rye bread, whole grain, wheat bread, wild rice, corn. It's the high glycemic index foods that we want to choose least often. These are the ones that it doesn't take the body much to convert it into glucose. So it raises the blood sugar fast. White bread, white rice, also potatoes and watermelon. Um, so there are some foods in this high glycemic index. I know for myself, I was surprised to see. So this is a really good resource to look at. It does list different food types in each of these three categories. And I will try to uh, list the resource underneath the video so that you can access it. The bottom line when it comes to carbohydrates is that your brain cells do need carbohydrates. Um, those cells need the carbs to convert into glucose, which is the fuel that those brain cells need to do all the amazing things that they do for us. We do need carbohydrates to give our brain a boost when we have low energy, but it's what kinds of carbs are you going to eat? Complex carbs are the ones that take longer for the body to absorb. It's kind of whole grains, foods in their natural state. Um, when you think about having breakfast, if you have a bowl of oatmeal, it takes a lot longer for the body to convert that oatmeal into glucose. Um, so it lasts you a much longer period of time. If you were to have a bowl of cocoa puffs, it would have a lot of added sugar. So maybe it would give you a lot of energy quickly, but it wouldn't last very long. So we do want to focus on complex carbohydrates so that our body takes a longer period of time to convert it into the fuel, into the glucose that we need. The next thing I want to talk about is sodium. When you think about sodium and our brain health, at the beginning of this video, I talked about how our heart health and our brain health are very closely tied together. So having too much sodium in our diet can also impact our brain health. We do tend to have too much sodium in our diet. So we do need a certain amount, but we overdo it. Um, so when you think about sodium here, recommended daily intake is about 2,300 milligrams per day, which equals just over one teaspoon of salt. You might say, well, that doesn't sound too bad. I don't put a lot of salt on my different foods, but it's through processed foods where we see a lot of our salt intake. Um, it's hidden in many different things that uh, we get in cans and bottles, uh, takeout if you're you know, getting some fries or something, they're usually covered in salt, so it can easily add up. So we have to be careful with the amount of salt that we have in our diet. Um, and later in this video, we'll talk about reading nutrition labels, which is an important part of having a healthy diet. Be aware of how much sodium is in the food that you're eating when it's processed foods. Be aware of how much sodium or how much salt you're putting into your food that you're making at home. Sometimes when you flavor foods with other things uh, like herbs and spices and salt-free seasonings, um, it adds the flavor that we're looking for without the added sodium. I want to talk a little bit about the importance of being hydrated. Hydration is important for our brain health, so our brain does need fluid in order to function properly. And as we get older, our, our brains are not very good at telling when we are starting to become dehydrated. So we almost have to take more effort to stay on top of getting enough hydration through the day, having some strategies to make sure that we're drinking regularly. Ideally, we want to be drinking water. Uh, water is the best, you know, we are made up of water. Water is the best fluid to get into our system. I know that not everybody likes to drink water, so you know, making water a little bit more palatable might be a good strategy. 
putting some lemon in it or some other kinds of fruits. Um, some people use soda streams to make it a little bit more interesting. If you don't like water and you're drinking other types of fluids, that's fine too. But just to be aware, if you're drinking things like fruit juice, that they have a lot of added sugar. Um, and certainly pop has a lot of sugar. If you're drinking things like diet pop, that has a lot of chemical um, sweeteners in them. So we want to be careful there as well. Things like coffee and other caffeinated drinks. Caffeine actually pulls water out of our system. So we'll, we want to be careful not to rely on that to get hydration into our, into our bodies. Um, so ideally, uh, we want to be looking at water if at all possible. In fact, it's one of the messages in the new Canada Food Guide is make water your drink of choice. So if you've got all the choices of different things to, to drink through the day, if you you know, are not adverse to the idea of drinking water to try to include more of that um, as your as your fluid choices through the day. And it might be that you get a water bottle that you keep filled up and you keep it with you and you just kind of sip on it all, all through the day and that helps to keep you hydrated. The next thing I want to talk about is fats. There are four different kinds of fats that we're going to focus on. There are the unsaturated fats and the saturated fats. The unsaturated ones are the ones that are better for our heart health and for our brain health. And there's two different kinds here. There's monounsaturated and polyunsaturated. It's the polyunsaturated that we call the omega-3s. So you might have heard that message before that omega-3s are important for our diet and important for our brain health, and that is true. Um, ideally, we want to get omega-3s through the food that we eat, and we can get those through um, fatty fishes, so salmon and sardines and trout and so on. Those are good sources of omega-3 polyunsaturated fats. You can also get that through certain kinds of oils, especially canola and soy. Um, flaxseed, so if you know, I often will take a tablespoon of ground flaxseed and throw it on some cereal or put it in a morning smoothie. Maybe grab a handful of walnuts to snack on uh, during the day. So there's lots of ways to get some of that polyunsaturated. You don't need a lot, um, just a little bit in your diet. As you'll see here, the limited added fats to two to three tablespoons a day. So they really don't, you don't want a lot of fat in your diet, um, but we just want to make sure the fat that we are getting in our diet are the better kinds of fats. So those polyunsaturated are omega-3s. The monounsaturated are also good for us. These are called our omega-6s. Uh, we want to eat these in moderation, however. They're not quite as good as the polyunsaturated, uh, but these do include the olive oil. So we'll hear a lot about olive oil being good for our heart health and our brain health, and that is true. Um, other kinds of nuts and seeds um, have that monounsaturated fats as well. So now that we've talked a little bit about the healthier fats, the unsaturated fats, we'll talk a little bit about the saturated ones here. So the saturated fats we want to limit in our diet, have them occasionally. A lot of the things that we consider treats, things like cookies and muffins, uh, chocolate, also those hot dogs when we go to a barbecue or whatever, those are have a high amount of saturated fats in them. So we want to make sure that we are eating those in limited amounts. The foods that have trans fats, that's the kind of fat we really want to avoid. We actually won't see trans fats in packaged food because it's been legislated out of packaged food. You shouldn't see more than a very trace amount when we look at nutrition fat labels. Um, but you know, we can also, as it says here, shortening. So if you're using shortening to bake a pie or whatever, it's going to have that trans fat. So we wanna really limit this kind of fat in our diet. So these are the ones that we want to eat in moderation. The Canada Food Guide was revamped in 2019. You may remember the old Canada Food Guide had uh, the four different categories of foods, so fruits and vegetables, meat and alternatives, um, dairy and grains, and then it would have how many servings of each type of category you should eat depending on your sex and your age. Um, that's been revamped as of 2019, as I said, and we don't have the categories and the, the number of portions any longer. What they are focusing on are some key messages around eating, which we will be going through um, in the next few slides, but also what we call the plate method. So you'll see here on the left side of, this, of the screen, we have the plate. 
And what they are focusing on is you have half of your plate be fruit or vegetable of some kind, a quarter of your plate to be protein food. So notice it's not meat and alternatives, it's protein food, because you can get protein in many different types of foods. If you'll see here in that quarter section of protein foods, we have some uh, nuts and some beans and lentils and tofu and fish and um, yogurt and meat. So there's a number of ways that you can get protein into your diet. And then a quarter of your plate to be whole grain foods. And again, it's you know, whole grain breads, but also pasta and rice and couscous and um, quinoa. And there's a number of different kinds of grain foods. And so that should be a quarter of your plate. Now, when you're thinking about portion control, think about the plate size. Uh, if you're using a big dinner platter plate, then you probably are getting too much food um, at a meal. If you can make it a smaller plate and follow this, this plate method, then you're more likely to get the right portion of food into your diet at the meal. So just be aware of the size of your plate. So some people ask us about specific diets that are good for our brain health. And there are three diets here that we talk about a lot around how they um, are tied to healthy aging and some that are specifically tied to the health of our brain. So we have the DASH diet, which was actually created for heart health and it stands for diet dietary approaches to stop. That should be stop, stop hypertension. One of the key messages in the new Canada Food Guide is limiting processed foods. Processed foods is a major source of saturated fats and salt and sugar. And so if we want to control how much of this we're getting into our diet, we need to limit how much of these kinds of foods that we're eating. I know that these foods can be quite convenient, uh, whether it's putting in a frozen pizza for dinner, um, grabbing a, a muffin in the morning for breakfast, but we do need to be careful that we're not getting too much of this because this is where we can really overdo it with the amount of saturated fats that we're eating or how much salt we're getting into our diet and so on. One way that we can make better food choices is by learning to read nutrition labels correctly. So this is another key message in the new Canada Food Guide. When we're looking at uh, nutrition fact labels, you will find one of these labels on anything that you buy in the grocery store that is not fresh or not baked in store. When you're looking at that nutrition fact label is to pay attention, first of all, to what's here at the very top. So let me just highlight this. This is your serving amount. So when you're looking at the label, everything that you see underneath, the amount of gra uh, grams, um, the percentage of daily value, it's all tied to the serving amount. And depending on the food item, that serving amount can change. For example, if this nutrition fact label is one cup or 122 grams, so maybe that's the serving amount for this can of, it looks like chickpeas to me, um, then, you know, a different item, for example, a loaf of bread, uh, usually the serving amount is one slice and then I'll have a, a weight amount beside that one slice. And when you think about a loaf of bread, the slices are not uniform usually. So we have some smaller slices, some bigger slices. Um, so the sometimes it's a good idea to take that item and weigh it on a food scale if you have one to see how it relates to the gram amount. But if in doubt, you should always take the weight and uh, apply all of the all of the information below that serving size to the weight rather than the item. Uh, sometimes if foods are in a pre-packaged, for example, granola bars, it might say your serving size is one bar. Um, cereal can differ depending on the type of cereal. So maybe a serving size for one cereal is two thirds of a cup, for another cereal is one cup. So pay attention to that serving size and measure it out or weigh it out uh, from time to time just to to double check to make sure that it is the correct amount that you're eating. Now, everything underneath that serving size here will have at the top, we have calories, uh, but we wanna pay attention to the fat. So first of all, we have fat. And in this example, our fat is eight grams or 11% of our daily value. So this is for a recommended daily value for an average adult. So 11% of our daily value of fat in this serving size. 
Underneath this, you'll see saturated fats, three grams, plus trans fats, zero grams. So as I mentioned earlier, there's legislation um, to remove trans fats out of our packaged foods. So you shouldn't see more than, I think it's 0.1 gram, uh, just trace amount. But you'll see there's a disconnect here. Well, your fat amount is eight grams, but saturated is three grams. So where's the rest of it? And that's where we have the other two kinds of fats, the unsaturated fats. Uh, some nutrition fact labels will list that under the fat amount. They'll have all four types of fats, but they don't have to. They only have to list the saturated and the trans fats amount. So when you see that disconnect, it means the other five grams are the unsaturated fats, which are the healthier fats. So you'll see here we have eight grams for the fat is 11% of our daily value. But here are three grams of saturated fats, and that's 15% of our daily value. So even though it weighs less, it's actually more of your percent daily value. So that means that, you know, a recommended uh, fat amount in your diet, eight grams is 11% overall fat. Three grams saturated is actually 15% of your overall daily value for saturated fat. So that's how you read that. The next one is carbohydrates. So as we whoop, and I mentioned earlier, sorry about that, that carbohydrates, um, 19 grams here, and different kinds of carbs. You have your fibers, sugars, and starches. So just like the fats, the nutrition fat label will list out the fiber and the sugar, but not always the starches. So when you see this disconnect, so here you have fiber, two grams, sugar, 14 grams. So there's missing three grams here. So that would be your starch amount. And again, over here on your daily value, so it actually doesn't have a daily value for a total amount of carbohydrates, but it has a daily value 7% for fiber and a daily value 14% for sugar. So just be aware where that daily value is, um, you know, line it up across so that you know what it's a daily value is uh, connected to. And the last one here, and this is that can be very tricky, is the amount of sodium. So here you've got your sodium amount, five milligrams. In this item, it's only 1% of your daily value. And the message here that they are focusing on is when you look at this daily value, 5% or less is a little bit, 15% or more is a lot. So I'm just gonna highlight that a little bit. Sorry about my highlighting skills. Um, when you look at something like prepared soup, so a lot of soup, the, the for example, if you've got a can of Campbell's prepared soup, usually it's 500 milliliters is the can amount. But when you look at the nutrition fact label, the serving size amount is one cup or 250 milliliters. So there's actually two servings in a can. So everything on that nutrition fact label is tied to the serving size, not the amount of soup that's in the can. And the sodium percent of daily value is often over 30%. So they are very, very high in sodium, those prepared soups. Um, often that surprises people when they look at that. So it just, it helps us to make those healthier food choices so that if it's over 15% for one of these items to just take a stock and say, okay, um, should I be, is this really a good food item for me? Is there a healthier food choice? Um, so it's just a quick way of identifying uh, something that maybe might not be the healthiest food choice for us. And there is a sheet from uh, the Canadian government about reading nutrition fact labels. And I will link that to the bottom uh, below the video. Another message from the Canada Food Guide is beware of food marketing. They try to sell their food to us so that we'll buy it. So, you know, the example here, we've got the French fries, limited time only, those kinds of messages that make us feel like we have to go out and buy something, um, supersize it, that's another big message. So recognize when the food is being marketed to you and we want to rely on those nutrition labels rather than the marketing messages. Uh, the marketing messages are meant to sell the food to you. The nutrition fact labels are meant to help you make a healthier food choice. So here are some examples of different marketing uh, techniques, whether it's coupons in the aisle that draw you in to buy that item or Ronald McDonald uh, appealing to kids to come and eat at McDonald's. Maybe it's your name on the bottle of Coke. So just being aware of when this marketing is trying to draw you in 
and pay attention to the nutrition fact labels so that you can make a good choice for yourself without um, being lured in by the marketing message from the food company. The next few slides, I'm going to go through some of the key messages in the New Canada Food Guide. The first one, if we're trying to limit the processed foods, is to start cooking more often and cooking with whole foods. When we think about our brain health, uh, when we are cooking new recipes, we can actually build our cognitive skills because it might be a new skill or we're trying out a new recipe we haven't tried before. Um, so try to pair it with building our cognitive engagement and trying out new things. More control goes over what you put into your food. So when you're in control of how much salt or what kinds of fats you're putting into your the food that you're going to eat, um, you can have much more control over how much you're getting into your diet. And we can save money when we are cooking at home. And I know for myself, what I have found during the pandemic is I'm saving a lot of money on food because I'm not eating out. I'm not grabbing something fast on my way home from work because I don't have time to cook. So um, it is showing, at least for me, that um, you can save a lot of money and, um, and eat quite well when you're cooking at home. However, this is one of the challenges with the pandemic is the socialization piece of eating. One of the messages in the Canada Food Guide is to eat meals with others. And we do know that socialization is important for our brain health, and that'll be a big topic in our next video. Um, but it says here that feelings of loneliness can decrease appetite. And we do see, for example, with our older adults uh, who may be widowed or, uh, you know, they're living alone, that they often don't feel like eating. They don't feel like making their own meals. And so, you know, the idea of tea and toast, um, but they're not getting the proper nutrition into their diet. So eating with other people, um, eating is a social activity often, and it is important. It does help us to make healthier food choices when we're eating with others. The next message in the Canada Food Guide is enjoying your food. So the more food that you like to eat and it's flavorful and you've prepared on your own, maybe you use lots of different kinds of spices. There's lots of great recipes out there that are, are very enjoyable and flavorful, new recipes, cooking at home, have control over what's going into them. So be open to trying those. Um, try out new recipes, try out new spices, see how it goes. It's about developing a healthy attitude towards food. And be mindful of eating habits. We often get into eating habits where we're not paying attention to when we're eating, what we're doing while we're eating. We're watching our phone or the TV or whatever, um, how fast we're eating. So this, this message of the New Canada Food Guide is to stop and slow down and pay more attention to what we're doing when we're eating. What did you eat? When did you eat? Why did you eat? Where did you eat? How did you eat? How much did you eat? Um, maybe asking yourself some of these questions when you're thinking about the meals that you've eaten so far today. Can you answer these? Um, did you pay attention when you were eating? Were you mindful about the food that you were eating? and what was going on around you while you were eating. And also what your body was telling you when you were eating. Did you eat because you were full or did you eat just because you were bored or because it was the time to eat? Um, so just paying more attention to why you're eating, what's going around you when you're eating, um, what foods you're eating and so on. All right, so I will try to link below the video some different resources that help support our nutrition talk today. Our next video in the series is the, the ending week of our four week uh, Heads Up for Healthier Brain series. And we'll be talking about social engagement, uh, the importance of social engagement for our brain health and the importance of managing stress for our brain health. So I hope you all enjoy me for video four.